So up next, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to get some, some into some details about the actual certification process and more about uh, NOP, what's certifiable, what's not, et cetera. And to help us with that, uh, we have Brad Schnitz. He works with EcoCert ICO. I mentioned that they are an accredited certification agency. They're based in Plainfield, Indiana. Um, prior to being part of EcoCert, um, they were known as Indiana Certified Organic, started by Sissy Bowman. Uh, but then when she was, I guess, retiring from the work of, of certification, uh, her business was purchased by EcoCert, which is a global company. They're based out of France. And they do a whole range of certification um, services, not just organic. Um, but EcoCert ICO serves as their U.S.-based uh, certifier. And Brad can tell us more about that. So with that, Brad. All right. Thank you. Uh, like you said, I'm, I'm Brad with EcoCert ICO. Um, I'm a certification officer and also an inspector uh, out of Plainfield. We serve the whole United States. Um, we have inspectors located around the country to serve clients that we uh, can't send our local inspectors out to. Um, today I'm going to talk about mainly the process of certification. Um, I'm not going to dive deep into the regulations, um, which would probably be boring anyways, but um, it's more to educate on how people get certified, whether you're a farmer or a producer or a processor, handler. Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, what is organic certification? It's a quality assurance process. Um, it's a process which documents that products are produced under production or handling methods are accepted under USDA's National Organic Program and the Organic Rule. Um, it's required by federal law for those who wish to label the products or use the word organic. Um, he talked about it before. Um, it's not a lightly used word. It must be uh, federally regulated to use the word organic on any marketing material for products. Um, the current certification possibilities, you can see here, it's any terrestrial agricultural product from, you know, pet food to personal care items to grain crops, anything in between. But it needs to be agricultural uh, in the background. Uh, I think mostly in Indiana we're dealing with grain crops, some, uh, some fruit and vegetables, but I think mostly grain is what we're here to talk about today. And I, I think it's worth uh, kind of expanding here um, on this, this bold headline, terrestrial agricultural products. So what, is, what does that mean, terrestrial, right? Can you... Yes, uh, I guess land-based, uh, soil-based. Uh, we do not certify in the U.S. any uh, fish or um, aquatic products. Um, it must be soil-based. Uh, that answer the question? Yeah. yeah, so we can't, so it's not necessarily just soil-based, right? I mean, because you've got hydroponics and aquaponic crops up there, so... There, right. If you've got an aquaponic setup, you could have the crop production end of it certified, but not the fish right. or shrimp or whatever's on the other side of that system. Okay, so so that cannot be certified under NOP. Right. right. Good point. Um, how do I know if a product is organic? Obviously, see the USDA organic seal. Um, it should be the same seal on any product labels. Um, there can be no modification of the, of the logo. It must be this logo to be on a product that is certified. Um, also, to use the logo, the product must be at least 95% organic agricultural content. Um, that other 5% can be uh, a 
compliant ingredient, but it does not have to be an organic agricultural product. It can be a processing aid, um, anything along those lines. Um, for multi-ingredient products, if the label lists specific organic ingredients, those must be certified organic and must be listed on the label. Um, you know, what does an organic farm look like? Um, we see environmental stewardship. Obviously, we see the recycling of resources, promoting ecological balance and conserving biodiversity. Um, Michael talked about it slightly. We can use some synthetic substances, but um, we're looking to put in place um, environmental practices and preventative pest management measures and physical controls before we use synthetic substances. And that is part of the regulation to have these preven preventative measures um, before using anything synthetic. Um, obviously, the pest management covers that up there. And also a huge part of you know, any farming is the fertility and nutrient management. Um, the or organic systems focus on developing soils in ways that rely on natural materials. Uh, manure based is a big part of it. Um, but yeah, that could cover anything that's non-synthetic. Uh, talk a, a little bit about organic handlers. Um, it's anyone who processes, packages, or stores organic agriculture and products. Uh, this can include brokerage of organic ingredients uh, to, main, to maintain traceability. Um, organic handlers mostly modify, sorry, organic handlers modify agricultural products using methods that comply with organic regulations. Um, those are examples there. And they must implement measures to, prevent, to protect the organics products from contamination of prohibited substances and commingling with non-organic products. Um, I'd say most handlers of food products um, have split operations where they've got you know, conventional product or non-organic and also organic. And they must have operating procedures that prevent the commingling of these two. Uh, he talked about it earlier, but um, for land to be eligible, you must see it, uh, 36 months since the last prohibited application. Um, the main way we verify that um, is through affidavits and field histories from the farmer. They're basically signing off um, that they have not applied any prohibited uh, materials in the last 36 months. And at that 36 month uh, timeline, the operation is Im immediately available for certification. Um, some other regulations uh, say you can't plant until you're already certified, but with the NOP, you can plant a crop before you're actually certified get your land transitioned and harvest that crop as organic. So if you're, you know, say you're gonna be certified, certifiable in uh, August or September of, let's say 2018, um, you, could, you could plant an organic crop in the spring and that at harvest, that crop will be eligible for organic. Um, both conventional and organic production may occur on the same land or processing facility. Um, on land, buffer zones may be required. Um, they are definitely required when you're butting up to a conventional field or anything that may pose a risk of contamination. There are no size limits, requirements, or limitations. Um, myself, being an inspector, I've, I've seen it all from the smallest of vegetable growers to, you know, grain farmers out in Kansas doing thousands of acres. Um, so anything in between is perfectly fine. Uh, 
documentation and implementation of an organic system plan, including the physical inspection, is required to maintain organic integrity of the processed organic ingredients. I'll get into it a little bit more later, but um, each client is inspected every year. A physical inspection, um, no matter where you're located. And we're always looking that your organic system plan that you put in place is being uh, effectively followed. And the records show that. So let me, I want to chime in real quick. Um, we'll, we'll look at an example application or organic system plan later this morning, okay? He'll get into some more details of it. Um, but I wanted to mention, could you s click back one slide? So this deal with, with 36 months, and he mentioned uh, affidavits, okay, essentially say, you know, signing on the dotted line that yes, there hasn't been anything prohibited, you know, no applications of prohibited substances for whatever time period. So with this transitional field that we have at the Northeast Purdue Ag Center, uh, Purdue took possession, ownership of that <coughs> land uh, at the very end of May this year. The, we're going to be sitting down here shortly with the prior tenant uh, to get details on the last application of a prohibited substance and have him sign a prior land use affidavit so that we can include a portion of the time prior to Purdue taking over management of this, this ground as counting towards our 36 months. So hopefully the guy will sign on the dotted line. <laughs> if not, we're going to be delayed oh, probably nine months from what we're, we're hoping on our transition, okay? So, so that's something that you see often. And I learned that uh, a lot of times prior tenants don't want to sign on the dotted line uh, on one of these prior land use affidavits. So um, anyway. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, like you said, um, basically only you can sign off if you've managed or owned the land for 36 months. Otherwise, you've got to get the signature on the dotted line from the last tenant. Yeah. Um, uh, what is a prohibited substance? Um, the USDA organic regulations through the national list uh, specifies which substances are allowed and prohibited in organic production. Um, he showed the regulations earlier. It's uh, section 205 in the federal code. Um, it's, you can also find a section, you can click on the website, it takes you to the national list specifically, where it covers for each scope um, what is allowed and prohibited for crops, livestock, processors, so on and so forth. Um, producers and handlers must refer to the regulations for specific information regarding a material. There are recognized lists of approved materials uh, by brand and generic name. Uh, these are available through ISO accredited agencies, uh, OMRI, the or Organic Material Review Institute, WSDA's Washington State's uh, approval agency. And we honor these lists. Uh, they do the work for us, basically. Um, if it's on this list, we will accept it as compliant for organic production. Also, a big note, approval from an accredited certification body must be obtained within, within your organic system plan prior to use. I run into this all the time where someone thinks it's approved, they use it, it's not approved. So their fields are thrown out for another 36 months. And also along with that, it may be approved, but there also may be restrictions with the way it's used. So you may see it uh, on OMRI or WSDA, but it comes with restrictions. It must be used appropriately, or that could be a non-compliant application, and it could throw your field out also. So it's a really big point. Uh, I tell everybody is always get it approved and know if there's any restrictions with that material. I'll just mention in your <coughs> folder, there's a handout with some basic information about OMRI, the Organic Material Review Institute. 
uh, and how to get on their website. And you can search the generic list, which is just the, the substance, you know, like, I don't know, sodium bicarbonate or something like that, versus branded products. So there's, you can search by brand or, or product name or just the generic substance. So there you go. Yep. Um, if there's any questions along the way, you can stop me. It's perfectly fine. OK. Uh, are there occasions where you can get an emergency certification to use a, a non-organic or a non-approved substance due to a, a unexpected emerging pest threat? I'm thinking of something like, say, say you found Drosophila on your peaches or whatever you're growing. There was nothing organic that would really well, help. Does that ever happen? I would say no to keeping your field or your crops organic for that year at least. Um, there are temporary variances, but they must be issued by the USDA. So we have, you know, drought situations or, you know, disease situations or fire situations that's been coming up actually. The, the fire retardant they've been spreading out in California. Um, that's going to land on some organic fields. So um, that could throw the organic field out for maybe one year, but that crop probably won't be eligible for organic sale. So there are cases where these variances are allowed, but um, usually the crop does not stay organic. It doesn't throw your field out for 36 months, but um, it's on a case by case basis and the agency does not make the decision. The USDA, um, they make that final choice. <coughs> so who certifies organic operations? Uh, the NOP does not certify organic operations directly. The USDA accredits third party certifying agents like EcoCert to review, inspect, and approve organic producers and handlers. Certifying agents may be private entities, states, or foreign governments. Um, like I said, all certifying agents are monitored by the USDA. Certifying agents verify that organic farms and processing facilities meet the organic regulations. Uh, there are 47 plus, we'll say 50 certifying agents in the United States, only one in Indiana. Uh, there's probably close to 90 around the world that certify to the USDA NOP standards. And producers and handlers may choose any certifying agent they choose. Um, I can't say that one's better than the other, but a lot of times uh, the way agencies do the pricing comes down to being a factor. Um, some people charge by acreage. Some people charge by the amount of sales you produce. They take a percentage. Um, so it depends on what you want to do. Certifying agents grant organic certificates to compliant producers and handlers so that they can market and sell their products as organic. So this is the biggest point I wanted to make today is the process of getting certified. Um, whether you're at the 36 month date or not, um, you can apply with us. Um, so you can get, if you know you're gonna be certified later in the year, in the same season, go ahead and apply with us uh, early in the year. We have the application submission where you're sending us, basically send you the application first. It's a nice fat packet of papers that nobody likes to look at or go through, but that's how we do it. Um, that's how we form the organic system plan and what you're doing with your operation and uh, how you're meeting the standards. And after we receive the application, it gets reviewed by a certification officer like myself somebody in our office goes through it, uh, make sure 
that everything we need is in there. Um, if not, we'll come asking for it. But we're not going to set up an inspection until we have the full organic system plan in place. From that point, we will set up the inspection. Um, you won't know the inspector until they contact you. Maybe somebody out of the office, could be me, but um, it could be also somebody located around the country. They go out to the farm or the processing facility and sit down with the producer and figure out you know, what they're doing with your organic system plan. Is it, is it being implemented the way that they said it's going to be on paper? So they're gonna go through your paperwork first, make sure that nothing has changed, make sure that your inputs or your materials that you're gonna be using, such as fertilizers and pesticides are the same that were submitted. Um, if you're on a farm, the inspector will go through the farm with you, look at all the fields, look at your animals, uh, look at the, any other production that may be occurring. Um, they're also allowed to look at conventional things. Um, they will check out, make sure that there's a segregation between non-organic and organic, good buffer zones between fields that have uh, the risk of contamination. Um, from there, the inspector submits the report. Uh, someone in the office, like myself, would review the inspection report. The uh, report um, may have no deviations. Obviously, there's not much to look at from there. <clears throat> it's good operation. We don't have to issue any non-compliances, no deviations. So that client is looking pretty good to get certified. And <clears throat> from there, the client has submitted the certification status. <clears throat> if there's any problems, uh, we will try to fix those at that point. The client must submit to us how they're going to fix the problem, uh, what plans they're going to put in place to avoid the problem in the future, or submit to us missing uh, documentation or records that were lacking at the inspection. From there, we either certify the initial client or we continue the certification. <clears throat> Like I said, the organic system plan is the producer's application. Um, it's hard for some people to understand, but all that paperwork you're filling out is becoming your system plan that we have to verify. Um, obviously, yeah, look, look, I just want to chime in on that, <laughs> and I think that's an important thing for, for people to understand is they often think, oh man, this organic system plan, I have to come up with this whole written plan about my operation, how I comply. That's not what, it, like he said, the application that you fill out for a given certifier, that becomes your plan. Okay, so that application, and we'll look at it later, poses questions about your operation to make sure you're in compliance. You're not just writing this document on your own, okay? You could, but you could. <laughs> uh, it would be difficult. I already kind of went through that, how we review the applications in the organic system plan. Um, also, within the review, we're reviewing your materials. You will be, the client has issued a material review letter that approves, denies, or requests additional information about the material. And approval does not mean flat out approval. Like I said, sometimes there are restrictions that come along with certain materials. I've already touched on the inspection. But the biggest point is that we are verifying that the OSP is uh, <coughs> being, a, being carried out appropriately. Um, the records are a huge deal, especially once you start making sales. Uh, we're auditing, like Michael said before, what's coming in and what's going out. These things need to balance in a sense. Um, we need to understand that the amount of seed you're planting um, makes sense for what you're selling. Um, 
Same thing with the processor. Um, we make sure that what they're buying equals what they're selling to the next user. Um, so it talks about the product balance. And also, along with that, we see traceability. Um, we're going to look at the records to verify, let's say, seed, for instance. We're going to look at who you bought it from, making sure that the seed is coming from a, um, a compliant <laughs> seed supplier. I'm not going to say organic, because seed is not always organic. Um, but it is compliant for organic. Like I said, the, and the inspector submits a report of their observations to the certifying agent. Then the decision is made thereafter with a determination letter. Um, I spoke about it earlier, but we send out a letter to the client. Um, if there's any problems, we will request that information at that time. Uh, otherwise, we can go ahead and submit the cert certificate to the client if we see no problems. So I want to talk about the organic certificate a little bit. Upon verification that an operation is in compliance, we can go ahead and issue the organic certificate. The certificate indicates the approved products that an operation may trade in. Um, products not on the certificate have not been verified and cannot be sold as organic. So for an example would be a grain elevator would be required to keep all their current suppliers from where they're getting their grain. We'll say corn in this instance. The producer must have the corn listed on certificate the grain elevator is responsible for this, and their own cert certification can be revoked without this document for all corn brought into the organic facility. So they're going to have, they may have hundreds of suppliers, different farmers. They're, they should have the organic certificate from every single supplier on file to, so an inspector can see that they are buying from an organic entity. Um, this process extends to all, opera all operations, bringing the product to retail sales. A big point that uh, FSA offices will run into, insurance offices run into, I hear it almost every day, I say it almost every day, that certificates do not expire. They, there's no expiration date. They just must simply be renewed annually. You'll see a, uh, an issue date, but that could occur at any point in the year. That does not mean at that point the next year that that certificate is invalid. Certificate is valid forever until it's either suspended or revoked. But um, it becomes an issue like this time of year, people, everybody's calling for <laughs> the renewed certificate, but we don't issue a new certificate until we complete the inspection. And we do inspections pretty much all year long. So uh, just keep that in mind as at the FSA level and the uh, insurance level. It's uh, something you'll run into, I, I guarantee it. <coughs> so a certifier should be working for you. Um, who you choose to certify your operation is important. You know, not all agencies are the same. We all don't share the same competence. Uh, for the purposes of assuring organic integrity, uh, certifiers un undergo their own internal audits and external audits. Uh, we had an audit this year from the USDA, which is a lot of fun. They're in our office all week and looking over our shoulder, but it's part of the process. Um, the certifiers must comply with the USDA's requirements for reasonable security by maintaining a system that protects you and your files. So we are very careful with uh, private information, and we must honor that. And every farm is unique. There are no right or wrong answers, really, with how you're doing your organic system plan. I, 
I've seen it all. There's always something new that I learn going to somebody's farm. Um, it makes my job interesting. It's always people are coming up with new ideas and how to, to maintain you know, their organic production. But um, it's all unique. It's designed, the regulation is designed to address the individual circumstances of production for all certified products. Uh, your certifier is there to, to work with you to determine if your methods fit inside the quality assurance label guidelines and to make sure that your products are compliant. Um, the more questions you ask, uh, usually the better for you to learn how to do things. Like you said before, we, uh, we cannot consult. We're usually telling you yes or no. The, uh, the consulting is definitely outlawed. Um, we can basically tell you, refer you to regulation. And this is what the regulation says. This is a yes or no question. Um, there are other resources in place to, to educate yourself on how to, how to manage your farm but we cannot tell you how to do it. Inspectors, anybody should not be consulting in the field. Um, I think that's about it, yeah. So questions, I'll just mention a, a, couple, a couple things just to follow up on what he was saying there. So that last one about how the regulation is, is basically uh, designed to deal with the fact that we have so many you know each farm each operation is is unique right we have different soils different climates different production systems you know so that is why the regulation is not quantitative you'll find that much of it is qualitative and that makes their job interesting in how to interpret these things in different situations so they each certifier comes up with their own set of policies of how they're interpreting and applying the regulation as they certify operations okay but it's still all to the same standard it's all to the NOP okay and another another point on the inspector I think it's really clear and I think you made the point but inspectors do not make decisions okay they do not make decisions about certification they just look at the operation uh, and, tr and try to see is what they put forth in the organic system plan actually what's happening on the farm and do their records demonstrate that. They don't make a, a decision. They write up what they observed in a report and send it back for the certifier to make the decision. Right. Okay. But you're both. So I am personally. Okay. Most people are not. But the so the person so if, if they if the certifier is sending their own staff inspector um, rather than hi hiring an independent inspector or something like that. The person within EcoCert, for example, who's um, making the certification decisions cannot also inspect. It'll have to be right. somebody else who's doing the inspection. Right. I put my inspector hat on, do my report, then I can't touch it after that. Somebody else picks it up for me. How do you ensure that there hasn't been any prohibited substances used on it other than self-certification? Uh, through sampling. Uh, okay. We are required by the USDA to perform sampling events. Um, at least 5% of our clients, we try to do more. Uh, this may be announced or unannounced. Um, when you sign the contract with an agency, you are opening your doors to be audited at any time, at normal business hours, they would say. So if we get complaints, um, a reason to perform a sampling um, event, we will, we will do that and we can show up unannounced. So that, and that happens all the time. I mean, and, and those sampling decisions are driven by a risk uh, assessment, right? right. Uh, Mostly risk assessment, also just completely random. Okay. Um, we, we obviously want to get our riskier clients to uh, assure that everything's good for, for the consumer. But um, so, that, so that could be parallel operations, right? Operations right. that have both 
organic and non-organic, they would be at higher risk for potential contamination. Um, and again, I think it, it was touched on one of the initial slides that in OP, that certification process, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a content claim, right? It's process verification. Um, so it's not a claim that it's free of all contaminants, right? right? It, you're certified that you have a process in place that is compliant with NOP. Right. Okay. It'll be very hard we don't live in a pure world, <laughs> exactly. right? When the state chemist does a pesticide investigation, they sample areas away from where they think the drift incident occurred to get background levels of pesticides and things right. to separate that from the actual contamination levels. Right. We don't live in a pure world, so. And we, we don't perform our own testing. We send that out to a USD lab to have that performed. So I got a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned certifications don't expire but must be updated annually. Let's say that you have some kind of issue. Um, is that is that approval actually denied or suspended or revoked or what happens there? Or what are the options when that happens? Well, nobody is ever just immediately dropped. Um, even a major noncompliance there's a process before that certificate is invalid or suspended or revoked. Um, basically, you're certified until you're not certified. That <laughs> organic integrity database uh, is updated um, quite a bit, especially if someone gets surrendered. Us personally, we try to get that updated immediately when someone is suspended. So if someone goes on that database can see all these people are no longer certified. But if a deviation is found at an inspection, um, the report is submitted, a decision is made thereafter, um, it could include a proposed suspension at that point. Um, that does not mean you are suspended yet, but you go in a proposed suspension and the client has a chance to correct it at that point. Um, sometimes it is not correctable but we must go through that process where there's at least 30 days while you're in proposed suspension or the client has the opportunity to uh, fix the problem. Um, but like I said, that, that certificate is valid until it's not, or it's revoked or suspended. Okay. Second question, could you give us a more specific idea on the actual cost of being organically certified? Let's say I'll just give you a scenario. Let's say a farmer has a 20 acre field. He wants to transition to organic grain. What kind of cost would he be looking at for the National Organic Program and, and also the inspection? For us personally, we do base fees um, for the scope of your crops, livestock, or processing. Um, there's a certification fee, there's an inspection fee, those are base across the board. Um, the inspection fee can be more if we have to travel, you know, far. Or, but the uh, after that, for a farm, uh, we do it by acres. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but a small farm just doing crops would be a thousand to thirteen hundred dollars, maybe. Um, and you can get uh, up to 75% of your certification costs reimbursed. And you do that through your local FSA office. Yeah, we'll, we'll get some details on that in a minute. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's something that I want to clarify that, yes, once you're certified, you're always certified until you're not. <laughs> but you go through this process annually. So you make any updates to your OSP. Uh, and then you'll have another <coughs> inspection and you pay the fees. Okay, so it is, it is an annual process. Yep. I have a question on your, I think you called it a material review. And is that like input materials? So like if you're a dairy and you're cleaning out lines, the sanitizers or input fertilizers, those kinds of things, exactly. is that what you're talking about? I have a question on a lot of those products, you don't have 
a full list of ingredients in those products. You only have an active ingredient mm -hmm. a lot of times. How do you look at that product and say, this is compliant when you don't know those inerts? It's usually reaching out to the manufacturer directly. Um, we must maintain confidentiality with them, and we do sign these agreements sometimes, but for their products to be approved for organic, they must release all the ingredients. And that's how we make a determination. And, and if you look at the, uh, the um, national list of approved and prohibited substances in the code, in the standard, uh, there is an allowance for EPA inerts. Right. That are that are designated by EPA as approved inerts, essentially. Yeah, there's always caveats. And I don't know all the details of that, but yeah. Let's see. Uh, for your uh, fertilizers, uh, ingredients, and stuff, usually when a, a company supplies you with organic products, fertilizers, and field products, uh, they will make sure it's certified. But still, one thing that we got to realize, once we're organic farmers, we as farmers are responsible. You know, if we get a product that was not certified, it's our land that gets out of production, yeah. not the fertilizer company. So if you're not familiar with the product, you do call in and like in your certifying uh, agency and get it verified. But usually once we get going, like Center Ag up there uh, furnish a lot of organic fertilizer sprayer, you know, sprays and spreads for us, they will have everything certified. They know what's going and what's not going. And uh, they get pretty dependable because if they spread something that is not certified, uh, usually everybody will know. <laughs> right. Um, he makes a good point that, you know, you always can trust, but you want to verify. It's, uh, it's actually when you change an input or material, or you add one to your, to your process, it becomes an update to your organic system plan. And it is required by regulation to update your certifier with any changes to your system plan. So that would mean you call in or s send us the documentation on the product you want to use, and we approve it before you use it. That's your verification, your safeguard. When we approve it, you can go ahead and use it. Because you know the companies may say one thing, and you just, you can't quite trust it. All right, uh, question in terms of timeline. Um, if my farm hits month 36 of transition in July, is that when I need to apply or do I need to start working with you on the application process in say February, knowing I'm gonna need to market my crop in October? You know, what's that? timeline or when should the farmer start working with you in that process february is a good time i mean really it's uh it usually takes a few months for us from the point of application to getting your certificate so um, we usually tell people give us three months because we've got to work with inspectors that are already scheduled for all our renewal clients We've got to fit in the new clients um, and get out to different parts of the country. But um, we do have an expedited fee where we can try to do it within a month. But three months is where you want to be at least. I'd say the year before even, really. I mean, yeah, that's fine too. <laughs> at least make contact. Yeah. Know. Right, yeah, most people will contact us when they're in transition. and. They may get an application to see what they need to do, how they're gonna fill it out. They may not submit it until, you know, three months before or six months before, but um, they at least go through the application and look at what they need to know and, you know, maybe send it to us early and we can go over it before. But yeah, a few months ahead is definitely recommended. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Yeah, with this transitional field at the Northeast PAC, um, I've already started the conversation with the certifier just so that I'm getting things lined up, even though we're still, you know, yeah. a year and a half, two years out. 
I do want to add to that, I guess. The inspection should occur before the harvest is complete. So you want to get this process started so we can get out to the fields before you need to harvest because at that point, it's really hard to get it done. And if you can't get out there before the harvest is complete, then you may not have an organic crop at that point. All right, so a couple questions. <clears throat> First one on the 36 month rule as it would pertain to animal production. You know, for us being raising birds, if you can start a crop to be harvested right at 36 months, could you start a herd of, or a flock of chickens or a herd of cows six weeks or whenever, however long it takes to process them and then process right at the 36 mark and call those organic? It's different with, with livestock mm -hmm. and each, Dairy and poultry are different. Yeah. The uh, poultry, for instance, must be under organic management starting from the second day of life. So after they hatch, they must go to an organic certified facility at mm -hmm. that point. Um, dairy, actually any animal, must be uh, on, under organic management since the last third of gestation. So while they're still in, Inside, they must be on organic ground, and that animal must be eating organic feed, the mother. Um, the only real caveat would be with uh, dairy cows, they can be transitioned um, from conventional to organic for only organic milk, but it's a one year transition time for them. They must be under organic management for one year before their milk can be organic. They can never be sold for meat as organic. Um, for slaughter, they must always be uh, under organic management from that last third of gestation. Okay. Uh, second question on organic fertilizer. So if you're using manure um, on an organic farm, the manure that you're getting, if you're not producing your own, does that manure need to come from another organic farm? It does guys, not. It does not. So you consider manure as organic material. Right. Okay. Um, we usually, we get this all the time. Yeah. But well, I've, ha I've had the same question from growers of mine is who are looking in the future to go to organic. They want to start using the right yeah. inputs. And, and the question is always, do I need to use organic right. manure or can I just use any manure? No. Nope. Once it comes out of the animal, it's good to go. Okay. No matter where it's coming from. The only thing we ask for is you're getting it from an off-site facility or you know not yourself uh, we ask that that supplier signs an affidavit that they didn't add any synthetic materials or some kind of insecticides or you know smell suppressants or something to the manure, to the manure right. not the animal but to the manure itself signing off that they didn't add any, anything prohibited to that manure okay yeah and so some of the some of the uh Poultry, conventional poultry operations are used to this now because they're selling a lot of manure to mm -hmm. organic operations. So it's sort of standard for them now, uh, this, this yep. paper requirement. Yep. And that's a good way for them to make So, th so that's money. an interesting thing is a lot of people don't realize that, you know, manure used in organic crop production can come from non-organic operations. Uh, there's a fascinating study published recently, r research paper stu uh, published recently in France where they looked at several agricultural regions in France and tried to do kind of a life cycle assessment, tracing nutrient sources all the way back to sort of their original source. And they found that organic systems nationally in France, about 65 to 70% of nutrient sources originate from uh, non-organic sources, okay? Uh, but as in the regions where farms are more mixed, mixed crop and livestock, that's much reduced compared to areas of France where it's dominated by just crop production. Um, so those mixed type farms, which is sort of the ideal, I think, in organic, uh, you see less of that nutrient flow coming from non-organic sources. I'd just like to make a comment on that, uh, when to reach out to your certifier 
one thing we learned when we got certified was the sooner the better because those three years you need to save your seed tags and things like that and if you contact the certifier a couple months before you want to be certified you might have a maddening search for <laughs> seed tags and records and right. uh, I advise anybody to get you know once you want to go into transition uh, contact the certifier and, and you know find out what you need to do it's right. really helpful yeah that's a good point we should we should be able to verify the, uh, any seed planted or any inputs in that 36 month transition period we should be able to look at that and make sure that those are compliant materials that went onto the fields I'm kind of reiterating here, but really what it just boils down to is communication with your certifier. You need to be open and honest with what you're doing on your property. And if you have a question, you you have to ask them to get approval first. I can't stress that enough because it's it's come up several times with what we do, and we deal with it on a daily basis. And it, it doesn't matter how good your intentions are if you're going to try to run a product or use something on your farm it still needs to be certified. You have to go through the right hoops or you're gonna be doing something that's not compliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good intentions can't, can't uh, <laughs> fix the problem. <laughs> there, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay, well we need to move on to the next presentation, so let's show Brad our, our appreciation. <laughs> 